Kajala Medical presents COVID-19 The Answers, the show that delivers the scientific evidence-based knowledge that can safely return us all to our pre-COVID lives. My name is Dr. Fumi Okanola and I'll be hosting the show. Every week you can listen to me interview a highly respected professional about the science that can reduce your risk of becoming infected with this coronavirus. So it's my pleasure to introduce Shannon Horn. Shannon is the lead campus engineer in the facilities management team at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's a mechanical engineer. Shannon, could you please describe to the audience what your job and role is at the university? Uh, yes, thanks, Fumi. Um, uh, so first of all, thanks for hosting us. And uh, we wanted to acknowledge and appreciate your efforts to help um, inform the larger global community. Um, I'm currently the lead campus mechanical engineer, as you stated, and for our CU Boulder campus. And so the CU has quite um, many campuses, but specifically the Boulder campus. And uh, my role has many hats from an authority having jurisdiction to commissioning agent to technical support for different campus strategic initiatives. Um, and in addition, I'm a co-chair for um, what we call Campus Lab Accelerator Team, which manages campus ventilation uh, specifically for labs in all areas across the campus. And then correspondingly with the pandemic, um, the rest of the campus has been lumped under there as well. Right, wow. So I want to start this discussion with one of the most compelling facts that validates ev everything you've heard and will hear today about the incredibly successful work the team has done at the University of Colorado. Since the indoor risk reduction measures have been put into place by your team at the university, there's not been a single SARS-CoV-2 outbreak in an indoor setting. This fact has been validated by the testing and contact tracing team. This is an outstanding accomplishment that all of you should be proud of. Congratulations and well done. Thank you. Yes. So, okay, let's dive in. You've achieved successful information measures limiting what is termed long range transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Shannon, can you please describe to the audience the meaning of long range transmission from a scientific perspective? Yeah, um, and hopefully if you've had a chance to catch Jose's bit on the podcast series, um, essentially a long range transmission is um, basically the virus suspending itself in an aerosol way in the room. So it's not in that close proximity conversational range. It's more at the volume of the space that the virus suspends or stays in, or alternatively when it gets um, uh, passed on from one room to another room via the mechanical ventilation system, if that happens to be um, what that room is served by. Right, thank you. So pre-vaccination, a team was assembled by the University of Colorado at Boulder with a variety of people with specialized skills to formulate a strategy to deal with this whole new pandemic world. Can you tell the audience about the facilities task force and your work with Professor Shelley Miller to keep students safe in the fall of 2020 and to date? Yes, um, of course. Um, the task force was pulled actually together by our Vice Chancellor for Infrastructure and Sustainability, um, David King. And um, it consisted of entities across the campus from student affairs, housing, athletic researchers, and infrastructure staff. Um, of which Jason and I currently work under. And we had subcommittees under that task force. Um, so what I really appreciate about your podcast um, is that it's, it's tackling it from a multi-layered approach and understanding the dynamics of the virus. And um, so essentially, uh, Jason and I were co-chairs along with the campus industrial hygienist and consulted with Shelley and Jose um, regarding what they're finding in their research. Um, at the beginning, we really didn't know what was going on other than that we'd heard it was potentially aerosolized. And, um, you know, we felt like we won the lottery. We had both Shelley and Jose, um, and it's not that common to have um, aerosol scientists on your campus. So uh, Again, we felt like we won the lottery and we reached out to them pretty immediately. And Jose actually also reached out to us to see what he could do to help. 
Um, and that's how it kind of initiated from there. Um, Shelley in particular was studying quite closely the, um, the Skagit Choir study, which was one of the earlier super spreader events that was happening across the globe. And uh, she was able to determine the impact of aerosols on the spreading of the virus from that incident. And so that helped informed our task force, um, some of the ways that the virus was spreading at that time. And both Jose and Shelley had written letters to the WHO saying, we're, we're seeing that this is in fact aerosolized and was hoping that they would acknowledge that to help the, the world out. Thank you. We're all lucky, um, as well as you being lucky to have um, the expertise of Professor Shelley Miller and Jose Jimenez um, to inform us all in the world. So that's fantastic. Um, so um, you worked with, as you've said, um, Professor Miller and Professor Jimenez to formulate a plan and, and with Jason and his team to execute the plan. Um, so from our conversations in the past, you approached the university campus like a small city and divided each space into a type of room. Can you please explain to the audience the genesis of this approach and how you implemented this venture? Yeah, um, in a nutshell, um, a university is quite unique. We, we literally are like a small city. So we have everything from residents to dining facilities to offices, classrooms. We even have bowling alleys, rec centers, and we're even classified as an airport because we have the ability to fly drones. So um, it's definitely a, a microcosm of what is happening on a larger scale globally. Um, and as I stated before, early on, we, we struggled to understand how the virus was transmitting um, and due to Shelley's research around the choirs and some restaurants in Asia, it, it became um, a focus to determine mitigation measures for each of the different activities that were high aerosol generating versus something more sedentary where people weren't really speaking much or not a lot of interaction. So just that dynamic alone um, put different activities into different risk categories. So our campus first approach was addressing the risk factor of what we were dealing with. And, you know, with anything in life, nothing is risk-free. And just like when you drive your car down the road, um, there's always an inherent risk um, in anything we do. So we like to give that analogy of um, a car when you, we decided to take more of a layered risk management approach to minimize the risk of transmission, which fortunately turned out to be effective. Um, so we equated like, you know, masks as like the brakes on your car um, and your seat belts to minimize the short range transmission. Hopefully Jose covered that. And then um, using cleaning and also um, filtration at our air handling units and our classrooms to um, mitigate the long range transmission paths. So when we looked at our whole campus and the outlay um, of the demographics of the different types of systems, we categorized them into three main types of facilities. And then from there, we could develop the plan. And I don't know if you want me to go into the types. I can get quite technical. So feel free to pull me back a little bit there um, too. Okay, so, um, so just um, to clarify, because we mentioned this in um, part one, so um, breathing produces aerosols, talking even more, um, shouting more than that, singing loads. So I guess not only did you have to consider, you said the, the different rooms and their dimensions and classify them in a certain way, but also the activities. Am I clear? Yes, the activities and then also the types of ventilation systems. So our team was tasked more concentrated on the types of uh, systems that were serving the space. And essentially we had three primary types and then buildings that were hybrids of those primary types. Um, right. And the mitigation measures at the end of the day were still based on filtration. Um, we can dive into some of the other options we considered However, um, we ended up with filtration at either 
there's three main types. One, there's like 100% outside air where you're just bringing all your outside air in and it's conditioned via a mechanical system. And then there's the second type is what we call um, recirculated where it, it combines outside air with return air from the space to condition the room. And then the last one is natural ventilation where windows are the primary source of ventilation for space. So different areas in the university had different types of HVAC system fitted or none at all. And so you had to work out whether to increase the number of air change changes per hour in some of them, if, if you could do that and, and, and put filters in some and then other measures for those rooms that had no HVAC system. Am I, is Correct. That... Yeah. And essentially the, the paradigm was to bring more outside air, fresh air into the spaces, no matter how they were conditioned, uh, whether the heat ended or cooled in a particular way. So, um, yeah. I, I cool. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> Ventilation and air filtration were the mitigation measures used to provide air clean of the coronavirus for all on campus. Um, can you please describe to us what modifications were done to the HVAC systems and the other types of units installed to do this? Yeah, so we ended up going down the path of um, putting minimum of MERV 13 filters on the mechanical units that were supplied um, the, for rooms that were served by those types and higher. Some of our spaces were already LEED certified, which means they most likely had MERV 14 and higher filters on them. Um, and then uh, for the naturally ventilated classrooms, um, putting filters on your window is not really productive and um, that actually doesn't address the viral load. So Shelley's work in particular was instrumental in helping us size um, what we call recirculated HEPA units that are portable and you can sit in the classrooms and it correspondingly creates an, what we call an equivalent air change rate, mm -hmm. um, which means it's cleaning the air at a certain rate um, to be equivalent to fresh, bringing the fresh air in from the outside. So I've spoken to a scientist about the portable air filters and um, mm. and he didn't like them because um, he, what he was finding was schools were just buying one filter, sticking it at the front of the classroom. And then if you have a class of 30 or 40, the kids at the back were not getting the benefit. So did you mm. have to do some work in sort of calculating the dimensions and how many filters were needed? Yep, absolutely. And also the proportions of the room. And so we often had usually three to four, it depended on the room size, but usually on opposite ends um, or on the sides so that it was picking up the full spectrum of the room. And when somebody is selecting um, a portable HEPA filter, you wanna make sure they're AHAM certified mm -hmm. and they'll actually say on there how many square feet that they will actually cover. Right. So based on those two variables, we're able to prescribe a certain number of HEPA filters based on the HEPA filters capabilities, but also the room size. Right, thank you. Jose discussed um, germicidal UV radiation earlier in the podcast um, as an indoor risk mitigation measure. Could you tell us if this technology was used on campus and if not, why? Yeah, um, we really, we found that technology quite compelling. Um, at the time, um, hospitals were actually in high demand for the technology and um, that was one of the interests. We wanted to make sure we weren't taxing or overtaxing that supply chain. Um, in addition, our campus ages anywhere from, you know, 120 to 10 years old. So, um, Oftentimes our electrical capacities and our infrastructure wouldn't be able to support that sort of technology without a lot more time and a lot more infrastructure investment to achieve that. So um, 
I actually find the technology um, great um, from a personal perspective. That's just my opinion. Um, we just don't have the space, the electrical infrastructure to support it um, and or the time and, and finances to implement it as well. Well, that brings up an excellent point, actually. So, you know, every building is kind of unique, really. And I guess you have to look at, at the structure of your building, things like your electrical, electricity capacity, your finance, and then make um, a decision based on the resources that you can afford to implement or what your building um, is, is would be fashioned towards accepting. So that's a really good point you've made there, which kind of brings, I mean, I mentioned it uh, previously with Jose. I think in order for these things to be implemented, there's going to have to be an improved set of engineers in every area that can help specific sort of major buildings and some education for the smaller ones, um, so. Yeah, and I, I feel, um, I imagine there's a lot of people that, you know, universities typically are quite tight as far as finances go. And um, I, I think um, due to Shelley and Jose's work too, giving some anecdotal things to help people feel comfortable or not comfortable in a space or to inform their decisions about whether they want to be in a space um, has been helpful. Like if it's hot or if it feels stuffy and the temperature is, is not being met, meaning like if your thermostat is calling for 72 degrees and it's, it's staying way above that, like around 80, then you probably know that you're not getting enough fresh air into your space. Um, yeah, or or conditioned appropriately, mean, meaning not enough air to support the the activities, and then um, and filters are fairly inexpensive. Um, I think this early on the supply chain issues were an issue at the time, um, but now I think that's been worked out. And um, Ashray's done a really good article on MERV ratings of filters and uh, their benefits and. Um, you can see where the, the MERV 13 filters are effective in capturing that viral load, specifically for the long range transmission. Mm. And actually uh, stands, is it the, the American body that, um, that sort of licenses filters? Could you, could you, could you explain, do you know what ASHRAE stands for? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so ASHRAE is for the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. So um, there was a great task force. They've got some great tips on there as well of things that have been collected from the whole engineering body of ASHRAE, I would suggest, and also their task force to help inform um, whoever needs it um, to use that as a resource. Yeah, and I think um, from my understanding, you should really stick to, because I've done a lot of research on air filtration and, and I think um, sort of risk mitigation during the pandemic. So uh, having an ASHRAE approved air filtration system or standalone filter is preferred. Isn't that correct, Shannon? Yeah, ASHRAE actually doesn't do the certifications. Um, it's specifically the AHAM, A-H-R-A-M. Um, and that's the certifying body for the filters. Right, I see. And ASHRAE provides the information. Yeah, well, they've done lots of studies about um, different, like from flu virus to just different viral studies. And there's a great body of work there that um, is available to the public as well, so. Okay, well, um, I'll get that um, sort of those links from you. And again, we'll provide it in the show notes. So moving on, um, so with regards to maintenance considerations, um, along with trained personnel and the cost to implement these systems, um, you, you need to consider maintenance as a major factor in achieving a su successful outcome from, um, from conversations I've had with you and Jason previously. So um, Jason's team helped to fit and maintain each of the HVAC units used in the risk mitigation program. Um, Shannon, are you able to enlighten us a little bit on what that entailed and outline what you believe is needed after they've been implemented to maintain the successful results that you achieved? 
Yeah, um, I mean, Jason, I, I'm not sure I'll give it full credit for the great heavy lifts that he did um, and his team as well. Um, but you can imagine a small city, we have approximately 12 million square feet of um, infrastructure to support. And uh, that's not, not something you just do in a day or two. Um, and um, Jason's team in particular um, was very instrumental in organizing and deploying um, the HEPA filters that we placed in the naturally ventilated classrooms. And then also uh, changing out the filters in a lot of our air handling units to MERV 13. And just a cautionary note, um, you need to be careful uh, when you're retrofitting your um, what we call return air HVAC or mechanically ventilated systems because the MERV 13s do add additional uh, static pressure or too much um, resistance to the airflow, which can limit your capacity to some degree and then um, also impact your mechanical systems longevity potentially if it's too strenuous. Um, so um, his team was great. They cataloged everything, set up preventative maintenance um, uh, schedules with each of the devices and also fine tuned all the air handling units um, prior to school starting um, that first 2020 semester back in the fall. And um, it, we felt it was important that and again, at that point, it wasn't fully confirmed or know what we know fully about the virus. So um, the team had a lot of um, conviction behind it, knowing that their jobs would potentially protect somebody um, and their loved ones. So. Um. Yeah, no, that's great. And so, yeah, that was quite interesting that you said uh, what you said about the MERV filter and Jose uh, mentioned that earlier. So the higher the, he said that the average MERV was six to seven, um, which didn't filter virus enough. Um, and the higher numbers you have, the better the filter, but then you have to take that into account. If you pick too high a number, then you're not going to be heated in, indoors or or you're not going to get the air conditioning you want because it would filter too high. So I guess that's what you were cautioning, which says to me how you need some form of expert who knows what they're talking about to fit these things. Um, so that was a really good point. Um, and then also my other point was that um, it sounds like there needs to be ongoing maintenance and um, because it's not about just uh, sort of changing the filter and leaving it or sticking the standalone filter and leaving that. They need to be checked um, and they need to be maintained. And I guess you have to incorporate that into your costs. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the cadence of that frequency um, it also depends on the type of system you have, like whether it needs to be checked more regularly or not. Given the size and the types of systems we have, we checked them about once a month. And that was um, what we learned. We probably could go to quarterly um, instead of once a month. We were just extra cautious at the beginning. And um, we're also in a climate that has fires. And so um, depending on your how quickly your filters would load, that would also determine how often you would need to change out your filter. So Boulder um, has a lot of cottonwood trees and during cottonwood season, um, they, they bloom and there's like cotton flying um, everywhere around town and they, um, they clog up the mechanical systems very quickly. So the one benefit that um, Shelly is really a good advocate for as well as filtration serves more than just virus um, mitigation. It serves also to mitigate outdoor air pollution or pollutants of any sort, whether it's from fires to cottonwood or environmental pollutants. Um, and yeah, it, it addresses all kind of viral loads. We've noticed that we've had a decrease in flu incidences on our campus as well due to the extra filtration measures in place. Great. We've talked before and you said the temperature and quality of outside air in the case of providing adequate ventilation needs to be considered in the planning of these installations. 
Could you please explain to the audience how and why this is important in the implementation of these systems? Uh, great, uh, thank you. Um, so usually um, when you're addressing, we kind of flip the script a little bit with the, the pandemic, meaning um, in our professions as an, an engineer and also an industrial hygienist, we deal with what we call indoor air quality issues. And usually it's like a source, like something smelly or um, a pollutant inside, and then you put in measures to mitigate or stop that occurrence. Well, the pandemic's the same thing. It's just on a larger scale that um, it's a, a whole new variable to play with. So whenever you're dealing with, um, if we think of a virus as like an indoor air quality issue, we want to address two factors with it. We want to address the quantity of air and also the quality of air, whether it's a virus or a chemical or something smelly um, that we're trying to address. So that's where this layered risk management approach came into play. So the first thing that needed to happen was the short range transmission needed to be addressed with the masking. Um, and then the long range transmission came into play more with diluting the virus, meaning we had less people in a space. So that meant there was more outside air per person. Um, and then also um, the quality. So that's where the filters came into play. So when we've added the MER13s or the portable HEPAs, that essentially was addressing the quality of the air that was in the space, regardless of the generation source. So if we take an example like your kitchen, say you open your refrigerator door and you've got like a smell of something's going bad in your kitchen. Well, the first thing you wanna do is shut the door to contain it. And then when you've opened the door, there's been a release of that um, smelly odor into your kitchen. Well, so then the mechanical ventilation system and the filters, the MERV 13 filters in that unit or the portable HEPA filters would then capture that um, odor potentially, or that just as an example, or that particle, capture it from being spread throughout the entire house. Right, and, and, and also um, from my understanding, if, if you were in, say for example, Alberta in the death of winter where it might go down to minus 20, maybe even minus 40, and you're trying to pull cold air from outside in, in order to ventilate your environment, isn't there different considerations if you were say in Alabama where it's really hot and, and, um, and you're trying to pull hot air in, I guess, for air conditioning, is there, is there different considerations there on how uh, the machinery works? Um, not really. I mean, they're, they're effective in all climates. So I think the, di the main difference is um, they're probably closing their windows, I'm guessing, in Alberta um, under negative 20 degree conditions. But that portable HEPA filter is kind of cleaning the air for you. Um, so in a way it's creating equivalency of that outside air being inside or creating that better ventilation. Um, whereas in the South, I, I assume, um, you know, the windows are probably open all the time and they probably don't really need the HEPA and unless or some other mitigation measure. Um, unless they close their windows because they're too hot. And then whenever those windows get closed, there's no means. They're, we're trying to create a mechanism to ensure that we're cleaning the air of whatever indoor air quality pollutant might be. And in this case, it's, it's either a flu or a virus or a smell. Um, Right, I see. I, and, and I guess in uh, in Alabama, they'd close the, the window when it was hot so that the air conditioning could work. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that case, um, the air conditioning system, we, we would want it to have a HEPA filter on it. So we're mm -hmm. starting to get a little bit more into the different types of mechanical systems. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes you'll you'll see these are actually super spreader type of uh, devices is where you see a little cassette on the side of the, the room and it just recirculates the room without any filtration in it. And this is what they discovered in Asia actually at a restaurant 
is the people uh, who got sick were in the pathway of this, what we call cassette air conditioning unit. And there was no filter on it and there was no outside air or fresh air in the space. So the device actually served as a mechanism for transportation for the virus. Um, in that right. Thank you. Um, so while you, you live and breathe literally and figuratively indoor risk mitigation every day, this would be new information for the significant majority of our audience. The process seems complex, time consuming and intuitively costly. What ideas do, I do, do you have on how this indoor risk reduction strategy could be implemented in real world environments such as schools, restaurants, public transportation, elevators, office buildings, etc., that might not have the budget or specialized personnel of the University of Colorado? Yeah, I think um, it, it's actually not that challenging to implement the filters or the portable HEPA filters if needed. Um, and if, if that is even too much, I'd suggest being having events outside and opening the windows. Um, as a, as a rule of thumb, and then also if the space is definitely too hot because there's too many people, that would be a, another kind of warning signal to maybe to make a different choice point if you're concerned. Um, and um, yeah, I think in general, um, how we have particularly viewed it at the university is it served more than just a, a virus mitigation tool. It's it's cost benefit is in all the other mitigation measures like the seasonal fires we get um, in Colorado, the pollen and the reduction of other people being out sick for flu or other um, illnesses that are going around the campus. So I, I feel like we found the value in our solution that it extended more beyond just the COVID um, mitigation measures. It's addressing more concerns for indoor air quality on a larger scale. Um, and in particular, in, in last year, when we had the major fires from California, all that we, Denver actually had the worst quality in the whole world at, for a few days there. And the, the spaces in our buildings ended up being refugees or refuge for um, the smoke that was outside that was really bad for everyone's lungs. It was really unhealthy and we were getting advisories and um, it was nice to have a campus to provide that support for the community. Yeah, that's just so fantastic because you often hear when you mention, oh, um, you know, you need to modify your HVAC, you need to fit filters. People think, oh, the cost, the cost, can't afford it. But it looks like, I think you and your Jose have identified there are, you know, simple and, and, and fairly straightforward ways of implementing these things. Jose even mentioned kind of making a box filter. And then also all the added benefits that you get in terms of reducing other viruses, so reduction in influence, things like influenza, um, allergies in the cottonwood, providing a safe refuge um, during a fire season um, of clean air. So I think that's fantastic. And I don't think there's any excuse now for these things not to be fitted. So it's great that you've participated in this so that the public can be made aware. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Shannon, for joining us today and showing us um, an example of a successful implementation of, um, of how you compact SARS-CoV-2 that's airborne um, through sort of air, um, through ventilation and, and filtration on, on campus. Um, and I hope all of the listeners will will take a call to arms and in their wherever they live and and demand that their authorities um, uh, repeat what you've successfully done. Thank you for really educating um, everybody. I know this is a tall order, and I just want to applaud the efforts you're doing as well. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Shannon. And um, please join us next week for a further episode of COVID-19, The Answers. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of COVID-19, The Answers. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, 
rate and review and do visit our website kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19 The Answers.